It's my very great pleasure today to introduce my colleague and my friend from the Department of English, Rosemary Sullivan. And she knows this, I'm a real fan. I've always thought of her as an extremely bright star in the Canadian cultural firmament. Rosemary's the winner of the Governor General's Award for Nonfiction. She's a prize-winning poet. If you add to these writerly accomplishments, the fact that she's been an important literary commentator in the media, she held the Canadian Research Chair in Literature, Culture and Discourse at the U of T. Add that to her writing and you get some sense of her position in and her influence on the academic and the cultural scene in our country. I think though most Canadians, including we academics, will know Rosemary as a biographer, tackling the lives and works of such important Canadian writers as Margaret Atwood, Gwendolyn McEwen and Elizabeth Smart. She quickly established her rep reputation as that rarest of beasts, the biographer who is provocative, but also sensitive, sensitive to both the writing and the person. I don't think it's surprising that her audience therefore is to be found both in the scholarly arena and in the general reading public and on both sides of the Atlantic. One of the reasons I think for her impact is that she herself is a really gifted writer, writer of poetry, of travel literature, not just of academic articles and books as well as biographies. In fact, in her introduction to Rosemary's 2003 book called Cuba, Grace Under Pressure, Margaret Atwood wrote the following. As a poet and writer, she knows that life is lived not as theory, but as practice, that we exist on earth not as ideas, but as living creatures, and that you can understand nothing about a place without listening to individual people and their stories. She has concerned herself with intense particulars, end of quote, and she has. But Rosemary's never been an ivory tower intellectual, and I, she'll, she'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I seem to remember after personal trips to the Soviet Union and Czechoslovakia in the late 70s, where she met dissident writers and viewed Samizdat texts by her colleague and friend Joseph Skvoretsky, she returned to Canada to work for Amnesty International. In 1980, she founded the Toronto Arts Group, Group for Human Rights and conceived and organized a really exciting international congress called the Writer in Human Rights in aid of Amnesty International. She returned to Russia and as you'll hear many other places more recently when she began her biography, Stalin's Daughter. And today she's going to give us a glimpse, I think, of the process of researching and writing about, as her title puts it, an extraordinary and tumultuous life. Over to you, Rosemary, to unmute yourself. Linda and I have been friends for so long. That was so moving and probably the most eloquent introduction I've ever had. So I need to return the favor because <laughs> my introduction to Linda would be equally long and equally effusive. <laughs> um, I wanted to uh, try to, as I said to Linda, I want to um, uh, talk to you about the adventure of biography, keeping this somewhat light in these dark times, if it's possible to speak lightly of the uh, life of Stalin's daughter but it will be a story of the um, adventure that was involved in writing this. Um, how did I come, a good Canadian writer who had written, I mean, Canadian writer, who had written uh, four biographies, one of an international figure, Avarian Fry. How did I come to write about Stalin's daughter? Well, I got a phone call. I got a phone call on uh, November 23rd, 2011, from my editor, Claire Wachtel in New York. And she said, Rosemary, what's, what's your next book? I said, well, Claire, I don't know yet. And she said, I have two words for you, Stalin's daughter. I said, Claire, I don't speak Russian. She says, you have 10 days to write the proposal. <laughs> and that was the beginning. Um, I thought, well, it's Claire, she's a brilliant, she was then, she's since retired, the, one of the highest regarded uh, uh, academics and, uh, sorry, editors in New York. So I started to look at the possibility of doing this, writing a biography of Stalin's daughter. And I did throw myself back to those days when I had gone to the Soviet Union. I was living in London for a year on a Canada Council grant. I was, had just started a new job at the University of Toronto at Arendelle College. And shockingly, they gave me the permission to get out, to go away the second year I was in the job. Uh, I lived in London and I found that uh, 
there's something very peculiar about British culture. They don't want to bother you. Therefore, it's very hard to make friends in Britain until you have a moniker to carry you. So I saw this ad saying Aeroflot trip to the Soviet Union. So I thought oh, I'll go on my own. And so I, I went to the Soviet Union. I had a friend who was in the BBC who introduced me to Kevin Ruane, the BBC um, reporter there. And I then, as, as Linda suggested, I was able to visit some dissidents and I saw the double, double side of Russia, that extraordinary rich 19th century Tolstoyan culture uh, in some of these beautiful old apartments. I also saw uh, the totalitarian side when uh, the uh, tour girl who was guiding us got arrested for taking us off the route. And I asked the, uh, our British agent what was going on. And she said, she wanted her job. And I understood that the Soviet system was built on betrayal. So I thought, you know, I, I have an instinct at least, a small instinct for Svetlana's world. But as you know, she defected in 1967. She spent more of her, of her life in the United States than she did in Russia. Once she came to the United States, her whole life was in English. All her correspondence was in English. She wasn't able to write back to people in the Soviet Union because it would have compromised them. I thought, here's a story I could tell. I could begin the biography with her defection and talk about the impact because she was kind of a shuttlecock between uh, the East and the West in the Cold War. The more I looked, uh, the more I thought, uh, I needed to go further back. I checked, as you can, under the Freedom of Information Act, I, I checked the NARA files, I checked the FBI files, I checked the CIA files. I began to understand what an extraordinary kerfuffle had occurred when Svetlana defected. So I thought, okay, what I need to do is I'm going to write this biography. I wrote the 10 page proposal for Claire. She liked it. I got the contract. I got the advance. Uh, biography is expensive. Don't ever do a biography if you don't have an advance. Uh, and, I, and then I did the first thing you always do with biography. I approached the literary executor of Svetlana's estate who happened to be her daughter. So I wrote a long letter to her daughter saying that I wanted to do a biography of her mother. I sent her uh, my book thinking she was probably seeing pictures of her and thinking she was probably pretty funky. I sent her a book called Labyrinth of Desire and my biography of Elizabeth Smart. And then I got an email saying, it has come to my attention that you are writing a biography of my mother cease and desist or I will have to turn to my lawyers. I thought, well, what's the next project? <laughs> and then I got another email about a week later. She said, our, our letters crossed, I will see you. So I flew to, uh, to Portland on the plane thinking, oh my God, I'm going to meet Stalin's grandson. <laughs> Sorry, granddaughter. I was doing to Chris what everybody did to Svetlana. Nobody could see her other than as Stalin's daughter. Here I was going to meet Stalin's granddaughter. We had dinner, she had brought someone along for protection, but we found out that we really uh, were in sync. And I spent three days in Portland interviewing her for the, for, uh, once I went back several times. Uh, but there was a moment when uh, we sat in my, in my motel room and she was sitting uh, on, on a couch, the sun was setting behind her, it was darkening. And she said to me, you know, sometimes my mother fell into the night terrors of a child alone and lost. She was inconsolable. You didn't know what, but something triggered a volcano of thoughts memories, pain, anguish, fear about something coming up, surfacing to overwhelm her. And that became one side of my almost schizophrenic image of Stalin's daughter. On the one hand, that childlike vulnerability. On the other hand, this incredible egotistical arrogance where, where she could, uh, charge ahead, irrespective of who she might be hurting. Uh, it, was, it was very moving, this idea of 
of the night terrors of the child. And I began cumulatively, cumulatively to understand what could have occasioned those night terrors. Of course, her mother committed suicide when Svetlana was six years old. Suddenly her, her world changed and the KGB became her minders in her father, her, her father moved their house to the uh, Kremlin. She was in this official uh, residence. She would go to Sochi and her dad would be back in Moscow and she would write, daddy, the wolves are crying, I miss you, these beautiful little letters. These letters hadn't been published before because I was able to find them in the National Archives in the um, uh, Moscow State Archives. Um, her father exiled a, an, an older man. He was a 40 year old, uh, 39 year old uh, filmmaker, Alexei Kapler, who was entranced by Svetlana because he said she had a freedom of mind and imagination that he didn't very often encounter among Soviet citizens. And when her father found out that Alexei Kapler had written his daughter, Svetlana, a love letter, Alexei was mar marched off to the gulag for five years, which was then extended for another five. So here she was uh, with that weight on her shoulders. When she defected, she lost her children. I mean, it just goes on and on one, one thing after another, but what's extraordinary about it is her stamina to keep going. In 1967, well, in, this, in the mid-60s, um, Svetlana was in hospital. Uh, I hope, I kind of assuming you haven't read the biography, so I'm not telling you stuff you already know. <laughs> uh, she met in the, in the hospital a, um, an Indian companion uh, whom she wanted to marry, Rajiv Singh. And the, uh, by that time, her father was dead. Uh, he had died in 53. Uh, and most of you have probably seen that ridiculous and wonderful film, The Death of Stalin. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just love that film because <laughs> it's not that far from the truth with Barry and Khrushchev and whatever. Uh, but anyway, in, in 67, she went to, uh, uh, Rajiv Singh died and he'd asked her to take his uh, ashes to the uh, Ganges. When she had asked to marry him, the Kremlin had told her, uh, Stalin's daughter does not marry a fakir, as they put it, an Indian. Uh, but then when she asked to take his ashes back, she was given permission the next morning because uh, the Soviet Union was working on a deal, an arms trade deal with India and Indira Gandhi was involved. So she, she goes to India and then she just gets fed up with being what she called cultural property rather than a person and she decides to defect. So I need to tell the story of Svetlana's defection and where am I going to find it? I looked uh, up I was going through various, um, ah, I've lost my notes, various, um, hmm. uh, various interviews with, with uh, Svetlana. And I came across this very eccentric um, uh, tape, video, a video interview. Uh, with, uh, that was done at the International Spy Museum in Washington. And it was a man who had been, um, Peter Ernst, who had been a CIA officer. And he decided to interview the CIA officer who accompanied Svetlana out of India when she defected. So here suddenly was Robert Rail, the CIA guy. So I thought, well, how do I get a hold of him? So I flew down to Washington and I went to the International Spy Museum. If you ever are in Washington, it's like walking into 007's private cabinet, the cars, the guns, the whatever. But if you get to go into the elevators up to the first fourth floor, you'll find the real CIA spooks, all retired with their collection of archives and so on. So I went to Peter Ernst and I said, I'd like to reach Robert Rail, and they gave me his address. So then I went to stay at, again, if you're in Washington, stay at the Tabard Inn. It's like being in a, an Andy Warhol museum. Uh, beside my door in the, rest, in the hotel was a picture of the Mona Lisa holding a cod. And it was called Da Vinci's Cod. <laughs> and there was a bath with a, uh, a mannequin in it, etc. But very tasteful, the best restaurant in Washington. So I'm at the Talbot. 
Uh, they're playing what sounds weirdly like Soviet music. I talk to the uh, musician who is Russian and I say, I'm going to uh, write a book about Stalin's daughter. And he said, her father must have loved her, otherwise he would have killed her. <laughs> that was you know, the Russian response. I phoned Robert Rail and his wife said, well, Robert's not feeling quite well, but he really wants to see you. So please come tomorrow morning. I had my husband with me because actually I had just had a knee replacement surgery and he was driving. So we get to uh, the, the Rails house in Virginia and Ramona Rail says, well, Bob's not feeling that well, but he really wants to see you. So I go in and I see two legs on the bathroom floor and she looks at me, she says, well, maybe not today. <laughs> and she takes a collection of personal letters from Svetlana to Bob Rail that go from 67 to 2020. And she says, here, take these and mail them back. You can imagine what that means to me. Here, I, I said, you know, I'm, I'm bringing them back. I'm not mailing them back. But here I had the original letters, plus also clippings that they had saved and anecdotes and so on. So I had, that's what you need as a biography. You need those few people who will give you the narrative. And while letters are just one interpretation of reality, they give you the chronological story. So anyway, I, I phoned Bob, who was better the next day. I flew back to Toronto. And when I went back to see them, I stayed for three days with the rails as they told me all the stories about Svetlana's defection. And it, it was kind of an, a very American defection <laughs> because um, I wonder what I did with my notes. <laughs> um, She uh, decided that she couldn't take the uh, Soviet um, officials any longer. Uh, and so she uh, staged her escape by leaving everything, everything she owned, including her presence to her children, on the bed at the uh, U USSR embassy in India where she was staying. And she called a cab and she snuck out. It was very scary because uh, mm -hmm. the cab took a while to get there. And she took the cab to the um, US, to the American embassy, not knowing what would happen. She went through the doors, they were closing, but when she showed her passport, they realized because it was a Russian passport, they probably had a, a Soviet passport. They probably had a defector on their hands. So she went in, sat down, Robert Rail was called, the uh, consul George Huey was called. And she said, well, you may not believe this, but I'm Stalin's daughter. And George Huey said, you're the Stalin's daughter? <laughs> Robert Rail never got over that. He just loved that. The Stalin? <laughs> she was carrying a book. She was carrying her, her book, 20 Letters to a Friend. And so um, they decided that she had to be the real thing. They didn't have time to check her bona fides, but they put her on a plane. Halfway there, they got the message at the American embassy in Delhi saying, kick her off, out, have nothing to do with her. Now that is not the story you expect from the Americans, right? But the uh, Under Secretary of State of the time, Roy Fuller, uh, Kohler, thought that he had uh, orchestrated a detente with the Russians and he didn't want the defection of Stalin's daughter on his hands. So they parked her uh, the, the story of her time in Italy is hilarious, but they parked her in, um, in Switzerland. Meanwhile, um, the agents came to buy her book and it was sold for a million dollars, which was one of the great tragedies of Svetlana's life. This was a Soviet citizen who had no idea what money was. And so when everybody came for money, including the man who would become her husband, Wesley Peters, she didn't understand that uh, this was something that was very dangerous to handle. In any case, uh, under the Freedom of Information Act, as I said, I was able to get the, um, the uh, CIA and FBI files uh, and all the diplomatic correspondence that, occur that occurred as they were discussing what to do with Svetlana. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was very exciting. Uh, it was part also kind of fun that my... Uh, my uh, mailman kept uh, coming with these uh, big packages from the CIA and the FBI and he was wondering who, who the heck I was. I said, no, I said, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, but 
it was it was important at that point to familiarize myself with everything because I decided it was time to go to Moscow. The thing that you must do as a biographer to get the credibility of those people you've asked for permission to quote and so on is know enough, study your subject deeply enough that they understand you know what you're talking about. Uh, when I um, spoke with Chris and she told me about the time in Moscow and, um, and Georgia and uh, in the United States and Princeton and so on, she gave me, as all biographers need to get, a letter giving me permission to quote from all her mother's unpublished material, letters, manuscripts. She also gave me a letter of introduction to friends of Svetlana saying that she, I had her permission. But the trick is you must get that permission without offering the possibility of the subject reading the manuscript and therefore vetting it. And you know, I, I'm always shocked that people do this. I wouldn't, <laughs> but uh, Chris said, you know, uh, she she would she would like to read the manuscript in in proof, and so in the end, uh, you know, one, once it was in proofs, I I was able to send it to her, and she just had uh, one or two little things she wanted kind of elided. She didn't want her boyfriend named. One or two little things like that, but when the book was done, she said, "You were on my mother's side," which was kind of wonderful because I don't think I. I pulled any punches. I, I gave you the dark side of Svetlana as well. Anyway, I decided I needed to go to Russia. I went to the um, Slavic uh, Languages and Literature Department and I said, I need a researcher. And they gave me this absolutely wonderful young woman, Anastasia Kostryakova. She was astonishing. She, I hope this isn't sexist on my part, but she looked like the most wonderful little Russian doll. She was, so, she was tiny, she had that beautiful Russian face. And so everybody wanted to talk to her. I couldn't have had a better <laughs> emissary. And she was also very, very bright. Uh, and it was she who, with my friend, Elena Romanova, a Russian friend who I um, took with me, I had the two of them with me in, in Moscow. Uh, they helped me through the process of interviews. So, all right, I'm, I'm going to Moscow. Well, how do I find out things there? I had been in correspondence with a woman called uh, Rosamond Richardson, uh, who had known Svetlana uh, in the 90s, and who decided, she was so moved by Svetlana's story, she decided she was going to write a book. And Svetlana gave her permission. And so she wrote a book, which is essentially, it's an, it's an extraordinary book. She was, not, she was a cookbook writer before that, but in this book, she's able to tell the story of the cousins of Svetlana, the mothers, uh, the, the sisters of uh, Svetlana's mother, Nadia, who committed suicide when Svetlana was six. Stalin uh, feeling that these uh, relatives knew too much, uh, had one or two of them assassinated. He had um, uh, Alexander's mother imprisoned, Anna. He had uh, um, Evgenia in prison. They were in prison for seven years until he died and then they were released. So this was the story. However, Svetlana wanted uh, um, Rosamond to write a book about uh, her mother, her mother's side of the family, not, not the Stalin side, so she never forgave her. <laughs> I was always glad that uh, Svetlana wasn't alive when I was trying to write her story. <laughs> it would have been impossible. Any case, uh, uh, Rosamond, I told Rosamond I was going to Moscow and she said, I'll give you a hint. Check the Toronto phone book. So I checked the Toronto phone book and here was Olga Aleluyev, who was the um, cousin of uh, 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 the, the niece, just a second, let me get the chronology right. The niece of Svetlana's cousin, the daughter of Svetlana's cousin, her niece, uh, and I, I, I phoned her and I said, I, you know, I would like to come and visit. I have a project. So I went and I told her that I was writing a book about uh, uh, Svetlana. And she said, we're not interested. She was promiscuous. She was unfaithful. She was, we're not interested. So I thought, okay. <laughs> I, went, I left her, however, my book, Villa Airbell. And uh, she phoned me and she said, I'll talk to you. <laughs> so... 
you have this sense that, uh, and it's still to this day, Chris won't talk to people, that they put up a front because they're so used to being manipulated in some way. Uh, when, um, so, so uh, I, I was ready to go to Moscow because she gave me the phone number of her father and mother who lived in that extraordinary monstrosity still that Stalin had built to compete with the uh, uh, US Empire State Building in New York. Uh, they sent me to other relatives, including uh, 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 Stalin's grandson, the son of his, uh, of his son, Vasily. Uh, and it was, it was quite, quite an extraordinary uh, list of people I was ready to visit. Uh, but there was something that uh, I still felt was unfinished, and that had to do with the um, with the defection. I did my own research when it came to the CIA files. You write to them saying, um, you know, under freedom of information, the subject is dead. You're required to give me information. They send you FBI files. I'm sure I got one tenth of the files that are that they have on. Svetlana, but still I got files, uh, FBI files, but the NARA files, that's, you really need to know what you're, you know, way around the files. So I checked the NARA files uh, in uh, Washington and uh, I looked to see who were the experts that were, um, you were advised to hire. Uh, and I looked at the first one, uh, somebody called Sim Smiley, the most expensive. And I thought, okay, that's the person I want. They'll be the most efficient. They'll be the fastest. They'll be the whatever. Uh, so I wrote to Sim Smiley and I said, um, I'm doing a biography of Svetlana's daughter. Will you do the narrow files? And I just love the name because I thought I was in the Graham Greene world. It turned out that Sim Smiley was a woman. And Sim, I, would, I flew to Washington, uh, stayed with her. She had actually a very funny story to tell. This is a complete distraction, but she had been a translator at some point for the State Department. And uh, she was translating at a state dinner, which was Berlusconi, um, uh, Clinton, uh, the two Bushes, etc. And Berlusconi described how he went to um, uh, to Moscow to meet to talk with Putin. Putin invited him to his country house. There were all kinds of wonderful young women dancing on the tables in various degrees of undress. And uh, so uh, uh, Putin said to Berlusconi, pick one, pick two. And, and uh, Berlusconi said, probably not a good idea tonight. And Clinton said, very wise man. <laughs> you can see as a biography, you have to love stories, right? <laughs> anyway, Sim was wonderful. She did the narrow files and then she actually went to she happened to be in uh, California. She went to Stanford and they have a huge collection of um, Svetlana's papers because somebody had been working on her material. Among those papers were two KGB documents and they were authentic. Two KGB documents uh, of meetings chaired by Andropov, who was, as you know, the head of the KGB in which they discussed what to do with Svetlana, not just her defection, but the book she was publishing. And their solution was to turn to her children and to make them agree to say that their mother was unstable, promiscuous, unreliable. Her son, um, who, who um, never forgave her for leaving because he wanted her to take him with her. Her daughter, who was uh, the son of a Politburo member, never forgave her for her disloyalty to the Soviet Union. But both these children, Joseph suddenly moved out of Moscow, according to um, my interview with um, Olga's father, Leonid. And then a little while later, he moved back in as he obviously accepted the terms for his level of comfort. And the second, um, KGB uh, uh, minutes, where it was a meeting in which they discussed what to do in 1969 with Svetlana's second book, Only One Year. And they were gonna make it clear that um, it was written by a committee and Svetlana was not a writer. Now, what intrigued me apart from this, cause I knew these were the opinions uh, and the strategies of the, of the Kremlin 
was how did those two documents come to be in Svetlana's possession? Had the CIA penetrated so deeply into the, uh, into the Soviet world that they could actually get documents of a, of a KGB meeting? Uh, when I asked uh, Robert Rail about this, he just kind of smiled and he did say, you know, he remembers he was, he presented himself as some kind of salesman of uh, kitchenware or something like that uh, in these displays in, in Moscow of American uh, domestic stuff. And meanwhile, you know, he'd sneak down to the river and take photographs of all the installations and so on. So they were pretty active. In any case, I decided I, I'm ready to go to Russia. I had uh, done the work, the, uh, the research. I took, uh, I was told never go to Russia without a man. <laughs> and uh, just to accommodate, I, my husband went with me. So we were four, my husband, Anastasia and Elena. Uh, and we started to uh, search. Um, because uh, Anastasia in particular was so good and so thorough, we went to just about every place that had been re resonant for Svetlana. Her model school, uh, 15, her... Um, the Gorky Institute, where we interviewed uh, a man who told us the story of what happened when uh, Khrushchev revealed who Stalin really was and Svetlana was in the audience. Uh, her um, apartment, she had an apartment in the House on the Embankment, which was also called the House of Detention because all the elite who lived there were mostly eventually arrested and ex exiled to the Gulag. Uh, she, we went to her dacha um, in the country uh, and uh, we went to the uh, National Archives and found these unpublished, previously unpublished letters between Svetlana and her father. You weren't allowed to Xerox. I don't think they had a Xerox machine in the library. <laughs> you weren't certainly allowed to do it. And by the way, of course, the, all the KGB files were closed. Nobody could get into them by, by uh, 2013, which was when I was there. Uh, since we couldn't Xerox them, we sat there and we read them into our uh, tape recorder. And then, so, uh, then Anastasia um, was able to translate them for me that night. Uh, going from family member to family member was an extraordinary experience. But I'll tell you, I do feel that the ghost of Svetlana had decided to visit me. On the fourth night of, uh, no, when we arrived in Moscow, we spent some time in St. Petersburg, then Leningrad. Uh, in the old days. Uh, and then we took the overnight train to Moscow. And when we arrived at the apartment, the landlord was there. He was an ex-circus uh, um, acrobat. Uh, but he said after, after the Cirque du Soleil came to town, that was the end of his, his business. <laughs> so he had this apartment uh, and I had, I had booked it online. It was a two bedroom apartment uh, in the heart of a very good district in downtown Moscow. Uh, got to by those magnificent subways uh, that you, you travel on in Moscow. And he took us around the apartment and oddly enough, it was only a one bedroom apartment because the, bedroom, the bed had been photographed with two different bedspreads. And he just, he said, oh, well, I'm sorry about that. But, and so he provided a, a, a cushioned um, foam bed for, uh, for uh, uh, Elena and, uh, and Anastasia slept on the couch. I had picked it because it was such a Soviet uh, uh, apartment with antimacassars and Lenin on the shelves and stuff like that. Uh, anyway, um, as we were going through, he said, you are so lucky you have a brand new bed. Great. The fourth night, we got a phone call at midnight and it was the landlord saying somebody had to get into the apartment. And we thought, My home invasion, what's going on? And so take charge Elena, uh, Elena, whose father was still in Moscow and he was a medical doctor with the army. She said, look, don't worry, I'll take care of it. So she went downstairs to meet the landlord. And we then feeling nervous went down and uh, we said, who's coming? And he said, well, actually it's the police who are coming. Why did the police need to get into our apartment at midnight? Well, they're coming with the suspect whom they, 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 they are accusing of being guilty of the murders that occurred there three months before. <laughs> so uh, Juan and Anastasia said, let's go for a coffee. I said, no, 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 we have to support Elena. <laughs> we had to stay. They finally came at 2.30 in the morning. 
uh, one car and uh, you know six big Russian cops step out of the car with the suspects, the woman. Apparently what she'd done is she he picked her up, the uh, American tourist had picked her up on the Arbat, the, uh, the kind of Yorkville district, brought her back to the apartment uh, and she'd spiked his drink and as she put it, he had a bad reaction. He was dead the next morning. <laughs> I, sorry, but it's, it's very Russian to laugh at such things. Anyway, then um, lead detective Lermontov came up to me and he said, I'm lead detective Lermontov. And I said, I'm Rosemary, because <laughs> uh, we weren't sure if Anastasia's papers were in order. And he said, so sorry for the lateness of the hour. And the cops behind him were laughing. And I said to Elena, what are they saying? Uh, she said, Cop I said, what are they saying, Elena? They're saying, in the old days, we didn't need to apologize. <laughs> in the old days, it was uh, arrest without right of correspondence, which of course meant death. Uh, and I thought, yeah, uh, Svetlana wanted me to know something going on here. Anyway, uh, I see you're a bit appalled, but it, 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 was, it never felt scary. It just felt like Russian bureaucracy. And also Russian um, kleptocracy. I've never seen a city richer and also poorer than, than Moscow. In, in 2013, the wealth was phenomenal. Going out to the dachas where you thought you'd see these tiny little um, cabins, it turned out that uh, they were huge, monstrous, um, um, three, four story uh, houses behind walls that lined up uh, along, the, along, the, uh, along the dirt roads. It was quite extraordinary. In any case, uh, I did find um, that the trip to, to um, Moscow was astonishing for me, uh, the people I interviewed, but the most important interview for me was with uh, Stalin's grandson. So how long have I gone? I'm, I'm getting close to my end, right? Uh, so uh, I went to, his name was Sasha Berdonsky. Uh, he was uh, Vasily's son, uh, Stalin's uh, second, second son. His first son uh, was um, born in Georgia. Uh, and Vasily was the dictator's son as you would expect him to be, a bit of a cliche. Uh, and so um, he, uh, he had Sasha and his sister and then farmed them out to his second, his, when he left his first wife, he farmed the children out to, to, the, to her and, uh, uh, or took the children with him, sorry. And, and it was the second wife, the stepmother who completely um, abandoned them. Uh, they went on fed, they had terrible childhoods. And Sasha said it was a great relief to go into the Soviet army after that childhood, <laughs> can you imagine? Anyways, Berdonsky was um, by then a well-known theater director in Moscow. And um, he ha had s words for me that made me understand Svetlana, I think in a way that I wanted to understand him, her in his way. I had said to him, you know, that his father, Vasily, was the cliche of the dictator's son uh, and that Svetlana was not Stalin's daughter. And he replied, no, you're wrong. He replied, his father, Vasily, was a product of the people, the freeloaders and leeches who surrounded him. But Svetlana was her father's daughter. She had his organized intelligence his unbelievable will, she just did not have his evil. He added, she was one of the most tragic figures that I know, tragic figures, and fate, and fate treated her very cruelly and unjustly. Here's what he said. Um, he said, Stalin was a kind of sinkhole, a myth, a sort of gutter where every legend drained, legends attached to his name. This made Svetlana furious, because uh, she felt that she knew her father and no one asked her. She understood, she, and this is a quote, she understood how power had drained her father of all human feelings. Quote, my father always killed people indirectly. All those millions whom he sent to their death at the hands of his agents. He himself would turn away and forget them, 
never giving to a thought to how they perished. But he wanted it acknowledged that, but she wanted it acknowledged that Stalin was not alone. Hundreds of thousands of people had colluded with Stalin in, in his, in his uh, crimes. She said she wasn't exonerating her father, but she insisted that the rot went deeply into the system. She complained that Russia had never faced its past and was destined to repeat it. When in 2000, uh, it looked like a former KGB officer was going to take over the presidency, she warned the West to be wary, the past is returning, she said. That was Fadlana. Um, this is a statement that uh, the, 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 uh, that um, Berdonsky, Sasha Berdonsky made. I admired Svetlana as a woman and as a human being. I cannot say that of all my relatives. <laughs> I loved her very much. Of course, she was difficult. She was a personality with charisma. I have compassion for her and it seems at times that I understand her very well. Each one of her actions seemingly unexpected, spontaneous, to me, they are understandable. I hold her in, her, in my heart. I am always on her side. Now that's one version of Svetlana. Uh, George Kennan had another version. As a biographer, you have a responsibility to try to, to balance all the versions and not pick one. Privately, um, I feel that Berdonsky knew his aunt and knew what she'd gone through, uh, that sometimes she was used in the West uh, and demonized for not being um, aggressively pro-American. Uh, at the same time, uh, she was um, she was a, she was. A, I guess the point was she never she never stopped. Uh, I have a comment here. Um, she was a shapeshifter, a Proteus on the beach. I had to struggle to get hold of her to tell her story. Often it was a frightening story. No matter where I go, she said, to Australia or an island, I will always be the political prisoner of my father's name. But as Berdonsky said, she was not running from, she was always running towards something, a version of life that would free her. Uh, Stalin had produced a daughter whose outside will took on the world with an optimism and life affirmation that stood against his crimes. Terrible. She was uh, not what I expected. Positive about her. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.